Dear pleasure to introduce Admiral Rachel Levine. Admiral Levine is the 17th Assistant Secretary for Health for the United States Department of Health and Human Services, confirmed by the United States Senate in 2021. As Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Levine is working to improve the health and well being of all Americans help the nation overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and build a stronger foundation for a healthier future, one in which every American can attain their full health potential. Admiral Levine is also the head of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, one of the eight uniformed services. After graduating from Harvard College and Tulane University School of Medicine, Admiral Levine completed her training in pediatrics and adolescent medicine at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. As a physician, she focused on the intersection between mental and physical health, treating children, adolescents, and young adults. She was a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry at Penn State College of Medicine. Her previous posts included serving as vice chair for clinical affairs for the Department of Pediatrics and chief of the Division of Adolescent Medicine and Eating Disorders at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center. In 2015, Professor for Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf nominated Admiral Levine to be Pennsylvania's Physician General, and she was subsequently unanimously confirmed by Pennsylvania's State Senate. In March 2018, she was named Pennsylvania's Secretary of Health. Um, during her time in state government, she worked to address Pennsylvania's opioid crisis, focus attention on maternal health, and improve immunization rates among children. Please give a warm welcome to Admiral Rachel Levine. Well, good morning. Can you all hear me okay? I assume yes. So thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly been the biggest public health crisis that we have faced as a nation and globally in the last over 100 years. And it has been very taxing physically and mentally, especially among our country's most vulnerable populations, but clearly we've all felt the strain. One important lesson of the pandemic is that we are all interconnected. The decisions that each one of us make truly influence our family, our friends, our community, our state, our nation, and the world. Despite the heavy toll it has exacted, COVID has also reminded us of a fundamental truth, that we truly need each other, that our happiness and our very survival depends upon our connection to one another and to our community. Now that spirit of community is what makes our country great. And it is now what we need more than ever as we seek to bring this pandemic to an end. Another important lesson is the profound importance of public health. And so it is critical that we ensure that local, state, national, and international public health authorities have the resources, the workforce, the IT capabilities, and the public trust needed to protect the health of our nation and the world as we move forward. Despite the fact that COVID has been so challenging, we do now know what works to keep ourselves, our loved ones, and our community safe. Vaccinated people are highly protected against severe illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19. Data continues to show the importance of vaccination and booster doses to protect individuals both from infection and severe outcomes of COVID-19. For those that are eligible for a booster dose, these shots are safe, they are effective, and they provide substantial benefit. Another critical lesson of the pandemic is the importance of health equity. The fact is that this pandemic has affected some communities far more than others, and it underscores the profound disparities in health that have plagued our nation for far too long. It has shown us the breadth and depth of the health disparities in our nation. All Americans deserve services that are timely, affordable, accessible, equitable, and high quality. These are, of course, our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our constituents, our coworkers. And as a nation, we can do better, we must do better, and we will do better. Now, I'd like to talk about misinformation. During the COVID-19 pandemic, people have been exposed to an abundance of information from a large number of sources. And while the large volume and steady flow of information from credible sources has enabled people to stay safe and informed, 
And it's also led to confusion. For example, scientific knowledge about COVID-19 has evolved rapidly over the past number of years. And that, of course, has led to changes and an evolution in our public health recommendations. It is essential to the scientific process that we update assessments and recommendations based upon new evidence. But we need to do this in a clear way. Without sufficient communication that provides clarity and context, it is understandable that people have had trouble, trouble figuring out what to believe, what sources to trust, and how to keep up with the rapid flow of information. Now, health and misinformation did not start with the COVID-19 pandemic, but what is new is the scale, the speed, the sophistication with which it is shared and consumed by the public and the widespread harm it is causing to our collective health, enabled in part by technology and social media. Amid all this information, many people have been exposed to health misinformation, and this has undermined vaccination efforts to defeat COVID-19. Misinformation, health misinformation has caused confusion, created mistrust, and that has harmed people's health and weakened public health efforts. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, belief in pandemic related misinformation is widespread, with 78% of adults saying that they have heard at least one of eight different false statements about COVID-19 that they either believe to be true or unsure it is true or false, 78%. An analysis of millions of social media posts found that false news stories were 70% more likely to be shared than actually true stories. And in some cases, this health misinformation has led to death threats and violence against health workers, against physicians, against public health workers. And it clearly has divided friends, families, communities, and it has divided our nation. So this is not just a COVID-19 issue, it threatens our ability to address current and future pandemics and other health challenges. And I thank FSMB's Ethics and Professionalism Committee for taking this on. Our health as individuals and as a society depends upon having accurate information from sources that we trust and that use the best scientific evidence available. But by making it harder for us to distinguish what is true and what is false, Health misinformation prevents us from taking care of ourselves and it undermines our ability to take care of one another. So health professionals have a critical role to play. We must continue and to expand their work to address health misinformation directly with their patients, including utilizing resources that the Department of Health and Human Services has made available to healthcare professionals across the country, such as Dr and Vice Admiral Vivek Murthy's Office of the Surgeon General's Community Toolkit for addressing health misinformation. Now, this includes, but it goes beyond COVID-19. So I'd like to just talk briefly about another area of substantial misinformation that is directly impacting health equity in our nation, and that is the health equity of sexual and gender minorities. There is substantial misinformation about gender affirming care for transgender and gender diverse individuals. We are in this nation facing an onslaught of anti LGBTQI plus actions at the state levels across the United States, and they are dangerous to the public health. They target and politicize evidence based treatments that should be considered the standard of care and actually aim to criminalize criminalize medical providers, including physicians providing care to their patients. A paper just published two months ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that receipt of gender affirming care, including what are called puberty blockers, gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists and gender affirming hormones was associated with a 60% lower odds of moderate or severe depression and a 73% lower odds of suicidality over a 12 month follow up. The positive value of gender affirming care for youth and adults is not in scientific or medical dispute. So we all need to work together to get our voices um, out in the front line. We need to get in our voices in the public eye. And we, can, we know how effective our medical community can be talking to communities, whether it's at town halls, schools, conversations with others. And we need to use our clinician's voice to collectively advocate for our tech companies to create a healthier, cleaner information environment. 
during a moment when public trust in our leaders and our information is very challenged. The healthcare worker community, the medical community does, I believe, maintain a high degree of trust and we have to utilize that and we have to utilize it effectively. Now, I want to address another issue associated with COVID-19 and that is the longer term impacts in turning, in, including what is known as long COVID as well as the impacts of experiencing mental health and substance use challenges and bereavement. These challenges are substantial. And while people have been suffering since the beginning of the COVID-19 infections, we're just beginning to understand these issues. Millions of individuals are suffering from prolonged illness from COVID-19, known as quote unquote long COVID. But others are experiencing the effects of a COVID-related loss or grappling with mental health and substance use conditions. Earlier this month, President Biden issued a presidential memorandum directing the Department of Health and Human Services to coordinate a new interagency effort to accelerate and further our work to address these long-term effects of COVID-19. And he has charged federal agencies with delivering two reports. The first will lay out the federally provided supports and services available for individuals and communities experiencing long COVID but also experiencing loss in their families and mental health and substance use conditions. The second report is a national research action plan outlining steps to bolster research to understand how to prevent, detect, and treat long COVID. There is a uh, over $1 billion project through the NIH, the Recover Project, which is, which is working to do this. This work will provide critical support to our nation to recover from COVID-19 and to better prepare for future, future pandemics. This presidential memorandum builds on existing interagency efforts to make sure that no one is left behind as we work forward in our fight against COVID-19. Now, I'd like to discuss something which I know will be further discussed during your meeting, and that is telehealth. The use of telehealth to deliver healthcare services increased significantly during the COVID-19 public health emergency. As the FSMB is aware, this was due in large part to the waivers and flexibilities in the delivery of medical care services under, authorized under the PHE declaration. Now, as Secretary Becerra noted in a hearing earlier this month in Capitol Hill, quote, during the COVID-19 public health emergency, telehealth has been a reliable resource for providers to reach patients directly in their homes to ensure access to care and continuity of services. The administration is committed to supporting a temporary extension of broader telehealth coverage under Medicare beyond the COVID-19 public health emergency to study its impact on utilization of services and access to care." Unquote. Programs like Medicaid and Medicare Advantage had pre-existing flexibilities that permitted them to adapt to increased telehealth use independent of the PAT declaration. And it is a, this is a priority area for HHS. I want to assure you that the department is approaching our telehealth agenda with intention, and it is approaching it holistically with health equity at its core. And this includes, of course, racial and ethnic equity, but it, it really works across all ages, stigma, levels of English proficiency, those living with disabilities, those with issues in terms of data literacy, and broadband access to these telehealth services, along with many other considerations. A recent publication from the HHS Assistant Secretary for Policy and Evaluation, recent analysis of Household Pulse Survey demonstrated that significant disparities among subgroups in terms of audio versus video telehealth. For example, though Black individuals have had a higher overall use of telehealth services, they actually accounted for the lowest use of video telehealth services. And this remained constant even when controlling for insurer. So this is a health equity issue. So there is an opportunity to build telehealth services of all types into a system of integrated delivery of care that ensures that it is a complement to, but not a replacement for, a complement to in-person care. These determinations need to be informed by robust evidence base. Now, the public health emergency was recently extended for another 90-day period and will be reconsidered in July for another extension. This extension covers a number of gaps in, in care, including allowing coverage of services from patients' home and any geographic area as originating sites, 
It allows federally qualified health centers and rural health centers to serve as distant sites, as opposed to their traditional role as an originating site, originating site only. Continue payment parity for behavioral health telehealth services and enabling audio only telehealth access for patients with circumstances that necessitate it as a preferred mode of delivery. So I'll reference the previous article that, we, that I quoted. Now we recognize that there are gaps not covered in this extension, including critical access hospitals and substance use disorder treatment prescribing. I want to assure you that there is a great deal of activity across HHS and the administration around policy development and evidence development to take definitive steps to support telehealth growth as an a integrated and equity-driven service in healthcare delivery. Now, I wanna to switch to issues involving the overdose crisis in the United States, which is something that I worked on extensively in Pennsylvania, including with our Pennsylvania Medical Board, which I had a seat on, um, and, um, and in my time now as the Assistant Secretary for Health. As you know, provisional data from the CDC shows that drug overdose deaths have actually accelerated during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we had made progress in 2018, 2019, but we have lost that progress since the beginning of the pandemic. Due to illness, deaths of loved ones, prolonged social isolation, and other challenges as a result of the pandemic that has impacted lives across the nation and across the world. And the accompanying stresses and trauma has had unique implications for substance use trends and people with the disease of addiction. Now, for far too long and well before the pandemic, Americans have faced barriers navigating our behavioral health care system and our addiction care system. And we have to deal with the stigma associated with mental health challenges and particularly about addiction um, to, to be able to eliminate these barriers and to expand access to the full continuum of prevention services, harm reduction, treatment and recovery services. We must close disparities in access and outcomes, eliminate bias and discrimination, and address the systemic barriers, including racism, that have contributed to historic inequities. So HHS has recently announced a new overdose prevention strategy that fully addresses the spectrum of drug use and addiction that can result in overdose and death. The strategy focuses on people, accelerating and amplifying access to proven opioid use disorder treatments, overdose prevention interventions, and other diverse substance use treatments and supports while continuing to develop new innovative solutions. This recognizes that the full continuum of integrated care and services is needed to help people prevent, treat, and recover from substance use disorders, and it emphasizes the department's commitment to helping historically underserved populations. Our approach spans public health, healthcare, and human services, and it has four priorities. The first is primary prevention, including, of course, prevention in our schools, preventions in com communities, but also working uh, with all of you in terms of what I like to call opioid stewardship in parallel to antibiotic stewardship, which is the very careful and judicious prescription of opioids, something I've worked on for years now in collaboration with our medical board and uh, in Pennsylvania and our, the prescription drug monitoring program. And we have reduced significantly the prescription of opioids uh, for mild and moderate acute and chronic pain throughout the nation, but we still have more to do. There will be new CDC guidelines coming out about treatment of acute and chronic pain, which I think will be very helpful. We need to emphasize harm reduction as the second pillar, evidence-based harm reduction, including the distribution and administration of naloxone, the distribution and use of fentanyl test strips, and of evidence-based syringe service programs, which have really had an evidence base for 35 years or more. We also need evidence-based treatment, particularly medication for opioid use disorder, but of course, there are, this is a polydrug overdose crisis, including other drugs that might not have medication um, that is used for treatment, such as methamphetamine disorder. So other types of treatments, such as novel contingency management treatment and other types of treatment are necessary. And then finally, as we work to get people into recovery, we need to provide recovery support. I want to note that this holistic focus on both harm reduction and recovery support is innovative and new. And we're excited to break new ground, providing coordinated federal support and money to harm reduction and recovery support areas. This requires an all hands on deck approach at HHS with concrete actions and efficient funding, but we need to work with all of you. We cannot do this alone. 
So I'm going to close and then I'm pleased to answer questions. We must learn the lessons of today to create a better future for us all tomorrow. Again, COVID-19 has taught us that we are all interconnected in so many ways. So please stay connected, stay informed, and stay safe. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm pleased to answer your questions. Thank I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We, we now you. have time for your questions. Please come forward to one of the microphones provided in the aisles and be sure to state your name and affiliation when speaking. Our virtual attendees can submit questions via the question and answer feature on your screen. While we are waiting for your questions, and I see we already have folks at the microphone, we'll go to microphone number one. Hi, Dr. Levine, it's Mark Woodland. Greetings from Pennsylvania State Board of Medicine. Um, great to hear you talk this morning. Um, thank, and thank you for all your service. We really do appreciate it. Regarding the last comments on health equity, what do you think about how we are currently doing bias uh, training during medical school and then continue it on through graduate medical education and especially in licensure situations with, in our state boards? Any ideas on how we should move implicit and explicit bias training uh, forward uh, for our providers? And again, greetings from Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you. And uh, thank you for the greetings from Pennsylvania. You know, I, I think that health equity um, is, is critically important, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that we have significant health disparities in our nation that, again, COVID-19 has laid bare. So I think it is critical that we address these issues of health equity and these health disparities in medical school education, in um, graduate medical education, and in continuing education. So I, I mean, I think that, that um, appropriate, um, appropriate uh, CMEs um, on health equity and dealing with health disparities and dealing with the social determinants of health um, should be included in medical education, graduate school education, but also available for, uh, for CMEs, for physicians and other medical providers as well. Um, so um, please to, to, uh, to talk offline about how to accomplish that. You know, we have spoken with the AAMC, um, and I know that they have a, a robust uh, program in terms of, of uh, working with medical schools in terms of this issue, and we're pleased to work with all of you as well. Our next question comes from the virtual world. Can you speak for a moment about options for the use of telehealth by the Native American population? Well, uh, the Indian Health Service is right at the table as we are working towards uh, towards expanding telehealth. But you know, a as you're pointing out, and I mentioned, telehealth itself has health equity issues because you have to have access to um, uh, to either computers or phones or tablets. Uh, you have to have either cellular or broadband services. And in many rural parts of our country, including um, in, in American Indian Native Alaskan communities, that doesn't exist. And so we will work with the Indian Health Service to try to expand that. But that kind of gets into the social determinants of health issue is that, you know, broadband access is not just a technological issue. Cellular access and broadband access is a health issue. Of course, um, economic opportunity is a health issue. Education is a health issue. Our environment is a health issue. Of course, nutrition and transportation opportunities, all these are health issues. And so uh, we will be working across the administration and particularly with Indian Health Service on that. A very important point. Thank you. Microphone number four. Um, hey, Dr. Levine. Uh, I'm Dr. Sawyer. I'm an emergency physician from California. I just wanted to know if there's any efforts that are being taken to integrate prescription drug monitoring databases across state lines to um, seamlessly integrate them into EHRs. I've practiced in uh, Charlotte, which is right on the border of North Carolina, and we know that patients could just cross the border from South Carolina, and we weren't able to see their um, prescription history. Um, well, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, th there aren't specific federal efforts to like require that, but I know that there are state efforts. So I'm going back uh, I, more than a year to when I was the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania. And we worked to, um, uh, with funding from the, the, the CDC and funding from SAMHSA, uh, we actually worked to integrate our 
uh, PDMP into electronic health records uh, for the major health systems and then smaller health systems and hospitals uh, in Pennsylvania. So it's seamlessly integrated. Um, and we work to do it across state lines. And I believe that there is a consortium, I, I can't remember the name, that is working to integrate them across state lines. And it, it is not an effort that is primarily uh, sort of driven by the federal government, but I know we use CDC and SAMHSA funding to accomplish that. Uh, if you have more questions, please contact my office and I can put you in touch with the CDC and SAMHSA to discuss that. Thank you. Microphone number two. My name is Mike, Michael Francis from, uh, the, with the Louisiana State Board of Medical Examiners. I, I'm an anesthesiologist and pain medicine physician. And I'm curious to find or see your thoughts on the influence of medical marijuana and states that have legalized marijuana on the opioid crisis, and which seems to be evidence showing that people who have access to medical marijuana and such have a decreased utilization of opioids. And I'd like to see your thoughts on that, or hear your thoughts. Sure. So I, I have seen that literature. So I'm, I'm gonna again put on my hat, my previous hat as the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania. Um, and in which I found myself the regulator of Pennsylvania's medical marijuana program. Um, and I really came 180 degrees on the medical marijuana program. I felt that um, Pennsylvania legislature did a great job in terms of how they constructed the medical marijuana office um, and the various ways that they passed the law. Um, and we worked to have a very evidence-based um, uh, you know, program for medicine for, for, uh, for, for medical cannabis. Um, so I'm not going to talk about other types of legalization efforts which are being done state by state. But um, I, I really became, um, uh, under correct regulations, a proponent of medical marijuana. And I felt that it did have, um, uh, and there was evidence for a, uh, a, a potential positive impact in terms of the opioid crisis. Now, I want to be clear, we're never going to solve the opioid crisis on the back of, of medical marijuana. But it was another a tool in the toolbox for chronic uh, for, for chronic pain, um, and that patients um, use medical marijuana for chronic pain and to, um, uh, in, instead of going to opioids. Um, I, I think that we need more research. I think that, you know, there's a lot of debate about this, um, and I'm speaking more with my, from my previous hat than my current hat, um, but I think that we need, I think what all, everyone would agree on is that we need more research on the risks and benefits of medical marijuana, and that having that more research would be very helpful. Thank you. Microphone number four. Hello. Um, my name is Marula Gleaton. I'm a practicing physician in the state of Maine. And I appreciated your comments about what COVID-19 uncovered about our uh, healthcare system. One of the things that I noted um, in my practice is that it, uh, it seems to have affected the mental stability of and challenged our children, um, their parents, um, elderly located in nursing homes, and then we saw it that there was an increase in uh, substance abuse, I think also related to all the stressors of COVID. And I'm wondering if the federal government has any plan to help states like Maine who, who find themselves very on the short end of the stick with healthcare providers for behavioral health. We don't have enough there. They're not enough trained. And I think it's a crisis that is gonna be off the rails as we go forward. Well, thank you for emphasizing that. So you are entirely correct. The challenges of COVID-19 in our nation have, have clearly exacerbated uh, mental health challenges among our youth uh, but really uh, uh, throughout the lifespan, um, as, you were, as you were pointing out, um, both from, from in terms of depression, anxiety, uh, and other mental health conditions, but also in terms of uh, substance use and um, uh, the disease of addiction and the risk of overdose. And so this is something that is being emphasized from the very top, from the president in his State of the Union address, um, and uh, that we are doing under Secretary Becerra's leadership at HHS. The secretary and others among us are out on, on the road talking about mental health. I'm actually going to be speaking about that today um, in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, and I know the secretary has been out and about the whole country uh, speaking about these issues, as well as uh, the, the assistant secretary for SAMHSA and others. Um, we have a behavioral health coordinating council that the secretary established. I co-chair that uh, with the assistant secretary for mental health and substance use, Dr. Delphin Rittman. Uh, we have specific subcommittees looking at um, child and adolescent mental health, looking at overdoses, looking at workforce issues, as you were talking about in both those settings, uh, working on, I think, the integration between physical health and mental health and how we can do that even better and other aspects. You know, um, HRSA has led the way on that in their community health centers with integrating behavioral health specialists into their, into their primary care clinics. I think we want to encourage that more and more throughout the country uh, with funding and with grants. Um, uh, we want to encourage novel um, use of, te of telehealth, especially in the mental health field, um, and also uh, encourage um, an innovative program such as Project ECHO, uh, which was uh, developed in New Mexico um, uh, for treatment of hepatitis C, but is used really throughout the country uh, for education and continuing learning by physicians and other medical providers about a host of medical issues, particularly about medical health and substance use. We did that in Pennsylvania as well. Um, so we're gonna be working diligently across HHS and the administration on this issue to tackle this. Um, the Surgeon General highlighted this in his advisory about uh, pediatric and adolescent mental health in December. Microphone three. Good morning, thank, thank you for your wonderful presentation. I'm, I'm Scott Metzger, I'm with the New Jersey delegation, and I, I'm actually really thankful that I, just, I, that I just came after the question from microphone four. We have been addressing the opiate crisis for the past two years in New Jersey. We actually believe quite strongly that addressing the crisis with a shift left is so important. Um, we, we know the challenges with treating addiction and, and what happens with the late stage treatments. So my question is, what can we do and who can we partner with to share what we've learned about the things that you could do at the earliest junctures to prevent addiction from developing in the first place? We've done extensive research. We've identified those most concerning junctures where things happen. And one of the things we came up with is the importance of behavioral health screening before you write that first prescription for opiates on a chronic basis. We identified a direct correlation between your morphine mill equivalents and the likelihood of a behavioral health diagnosis. So we're asking who can we partner with to share the incredible work that, that the state of New Jersey has uncovered as, as a group. Thank you. Sure, so um, I think there are a number of ways that you can partner. Um, you can certainly partner within New Jersey uh, with your state health commissioner and also the, uh, the single state authority that, um, that, de that deals with, um, that gets the SAMHSA grants and, and deals with the substance use issues and addiction issues. Um, of course, there are county authorities that, that, that work with the single state authority. Um, you know, uh, from a national perspective, um, you're, you're in New Jersey, so that is region two. And so I would work with your region two uh, representatives from Health and Human Services. I actually just met with the, regions, the regional directors and my office has regional health administrators. Uh, they're located in New York. Uh, SAMHSA has a regional administrator as well. And then we can work together from the federal, state and local perspective on these issues. I think you're entirely right. We have to look upstream. We have to look at prevention, uh, prevention in schools, prevention in communities. And I think that as medical providers, we have a big role in prevention in, again, what I have called opioid stewardship, um, you know, the parallel to antibiotic stewardship. Um, you know, just like antibiotics, opioids are essential medicines. And if you are in the emergency department with a fractured femur from a car accident, you need an opioid. And if you had a major operation an hour ago, you need an opioid. And if you have chronic cancer pain or end of life pain, you need an opioid. But in the past, we have, way over prescribed opioids for mild to moderate acute and chronic pain. Um, and we have learned lessons and we need to continue to learn those lessons, find out the best, the best way to prescribe opioids, the best way to monitor them uh, to, that won't lead to the disease of addiction. So we still have a lot to learn, uh, but we have made progress. We're very pleased to partner with you. Microphone two. Thank you for your presentation. This is Ali Moin, I'm from Michigan. I'm delegate from the state of Michigan as well. Uh, my question is, because we're talking about diversity and inclusiveness, 
When are we going to change the name of the Indian healthcare? I mean, that's really one of the best yeah. ways to identify is to identify the people correctly. Um, so um, I understand, and I and I I've, I've had a, a learning curve uh, in terms of working with the Indian Health Service and working with the uh, the American Indian Native Alaskan community. Um, uh, I will pass that on, uh, but I know that there that um, you know we have very very close collaboration uh, with the uh, with the tribes in uh, the American Indian Native Alaskan communities. Um, uh, both actually through the Indian Health Service, but also in our Office of Minority Health, which is um, uh, which is in my shop. Um, and you know, I speak uh, probably quarterly with tribal leaders, and um, I will make try to make sure that we always are using the correct terminology. Um, although I, I believe that from pers those perspectives, even though it might be surprising, we are. But we'll work to confirm that. Microphone one. Good morning. I'm David McClendon. I'm the president of the Mississippi State Board of Medical Licensure. I'm an independent internist from Mississippi. And Admiral Levine, thank you so much for your time and speaking with us today and your service to our country. And the topic of my question is back to the medical cannabis. Uh, Mississippi just recently passed medical cannabis, and there is the worry and the conflict that we all know of uh, marijuana being illegal at the federal level. Uh, but now it's a growing number of states who are passing medical cannabis. And there is going to be the worry of physicians uh, of being disciplined by the DEA that may prevent them from working with the medical cannabis that has been passed at the state level. And so I realize there's not a great answer to that, and it's just the difference but the conflict of the statutes at the federal level versus the state level. But I was just curious just about your thoughts about that issue. Sure. Well, again, you know, when I was the Secretary of Health of Pennsylvania, uh, the medical marijuana office was under my authority. Um, and I, I was the chair of the board uh, and uh, the, final, uh, you know, the final decision maker about how the law that was passed by the legislature and signed by the, government, uh, by the governor was implemented. Um, I don't know the details of Mississippi's law. I felt that, that in Pennsylvania, we did a very good job in terms of that regulation. Again, emphasizing the, emphasizing the medical nature of, of medical cannabis. Um, I, I, you know, I don't speak for the, the DEA administrator and I don't speak for the Department of Justice, but I know of no, I can say I know of no plans to prosecute physicians for acting under state regulated systems. So I know of no, no, no plans that they have to take actions against physicians or other medical providers that are working under the auspices of specific state laws. Uh, we're, we're very close to time, so I want to give uh, our, our final question will come from our virtual audience, and I apologize to those standing at the microphone. Can you offer any advice or guidance for state medical boards as we continue to manage complaints against our licensed providers who post COVID misinformation? You know, that's a real challenge. Um, and I, I think that it is something that, the, that, the, that is under the purview of the medical boards. I, I think that this meeting that, that, you're, that you're having is maybe the perfect forum to discuss that issue and to see how much you, uh, how much, uh, how, what kind of actions you can take. Of course, it'll be different under the state laws that you all function under, but what actions you could take against that misinformation. Um, I would refer you to the Surgeon General's work on this issue. Um, and if, if you're interested, you know, please contact my office. Uh, I'll be pleased to connect you with the Surgeon General, but this is a specific, uh, specific um, uh, issue that he is working on. But you know, I might defer to all of you in your capacity. Again, I was on, I had a seat on the medical board in, uh, in Pennsylvania um, to discuss under your, under your state laws and under your um, authorities, what actions you can take about this, about this misinformation, which is causing so much harm. Thank you everyone for participating and a very special thank you to Admiral Levine for being with us today.